Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Happy New Year. This is the first episode of 2024, and I have a very special surprise for you guys. But first, of course, I want to give a shout out to Blue Chew for supporting this podcast. Blue Chew offers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis for a fraction of the cost. Go to bluechew.com and use code Holly to try it for free. Um, Pay only $5 in shipping. Okay, so my guest today is the definition of a porn legend. She's won over 45 awards, including both XBiz and AVN Performer of the Year. She is an entrepreneur, a new mom, and somebody who really doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to introduce her anyways, the one and only Riley Reed. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me. What a beautiful introduction. I didn't know I had 45 awards. I was just thinking that because <laughs> I know that like we counted them and it's funny because when you get introduced and somebody, you know, kind of builds you up and all these accolades, does it make you kind of reflect on, oh yeah, I kind of have done a lot of stuff. It, there are definitely moments like that. There, there are so many times where sometimes I feel like time will go by quickly mm-hmm. and then I'll realize all of the little things that I've done in my life. And I'm like, oh, oh, it didn't go by that fast. I was like, it required so many steps for me to get to where I am. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how long have you been in the industry now? Uh, I started when I was 19 and I'm 32 now. So what's that math? Is that 13 years? Oh, girl, I'm in porn because I can't do math. <laughs> <laughs> so 29, 30, 31, 32. I think it was 13 years. It's a lot of years. It's a lot of years, people. (laughs) Going on 14 years. It's crazy, right? It's 25 years for me, which is like, I know, right? And I'm like, am I that old? How did that happen? No, you're not. You just started young. I did start young. It was 20 for me. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's so many questions that I have for you, but let's start off with – you know, the the big news that you have recently been crowned the champion of OnlyFans TV's cooking show, This yes. Is Fire. Um, as somebody who already has so many projects going on, what made you want to do this cooking show on top of everything else? Uh, well, the cooking show I thought would just be really fun. I've never had that kind of like reality show experience and like... I felt like it was the closest to that kind of type of production. Like, no offense, OFTV, but some of the other ones aren't as high production. I would have to say when I watched it, like- It feels like such a high, it is a high quality production. The camera work, the editing. Everything on set and like the whole, like it was fucking so many fucking people on the crew and everything. It was like 100 people. It was very high production. It was like super legit and everything. And so like watch, just watching it and then being invited to it, I was like, oh, I would love to be a part of that because that's like something that it looks like they really invested themselves into. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's actually going to be like, a challenge and a new, a totally new and different experience for myself. Like I like to just experience different opportunities. Yeah. And so that I thought would be really cool and really interesting. And so when I did it, it was crazy because I was like, not expecting it to be as intense that it was and like I don't know I was like being dumb or whatever I thought it was like gonna be maybe a recipe or something you know like and then he just gives us ingredients and is like make crab cakes and I was like wait what like I don't know how to make crab cakes what do you mean and you have no access obviously to the you have internet, no access no Google, nothing. yeah no nothing and you're lucky that they give you the basic ingredients because like I saw it and I was like what the fuck is what are what am I supposed to do with this like yeah and so yeah it was it how much was... cooking experience did you have before that like do you cook a lot? I have like a fair amount of cooking experience but like I mean I'm not like cooking crab cakes like that's yeah. not the type I'm not like that kind of adventurous cooker or whatever and like and I cooked a lot when I was vegan and so like that's what taught me most of my cooking actually was because like you have to get kind of creative with your cooking when you're vegan and so that's where I learned like how to blanch vegetables and fucking shit like that I never Mm -hmm. heard of blanching vegetables Mm because like when you're just making like steak and potatoes it's like it's more focused on your meats and whatnot yeah so when I was vegan that's when I learned a lot of my cooking stuff but I just and more of, I guess, like a red meat girl. I'm not as much of a seafood person. I like seafood. I just don't cook it. Right. And so 
being the first dish being like a crab cakes was really difficult but then it was like red meats and stuff which was pretty good and i was i could do like the chicken and i could do a steak um but then i lost like the the championship title it's against like season two winner so it's like i won season three but i lost the championship title so i don't i don't hold that belt this other guy came in and we had to make a ceviche and i didn't know that lime cooks your fish oh, and so yeah. like oh, yeah i oh no we were supposed to make tartare and i made ceviche because i put the lemon on the thing right, and yeah. so i was like i i fucked my whole self up like <laughs> i don't know anything about cooking seafood so i didn't win the championship but but I, won, I mean, season, I won season three. You've got a lot of awards under your belt. Yeah, I, I know. Like. I, Where I still, would you fit that on your shelf? I, <laughs> I still won season three, so yeah. I got that award. But right. yeah, not not the champion. So what? Um, like, what was the dish that you think won the competition for you? Can you point to one particular one? No, it's not. It's a uh, you go in like. Um, I don't think it's not one dish. So you like it's kind of like a kind of like what like the UFC or like how you like you have these two against each other and these two against each other gotcha. and then this winner and this winner go against each other and so like my first dish was crab cakes I just happened to make it better than the other girl mm -hmm. and so I don't think it was one particular dish gotcha. it was just like I happened to be better than that person until I got to season two champion yeah. that motherfucker came in and swooped me out like <laughs> he was so good and I saw his shit and I was like he told me my food looked like a lunchable and I was <laughs> like oh my god because he was right it did it was so bad like his the final season winner like he he or the the championship winner like he deserves it his was so beautiful yeah. like mine is embarrassingly bad and i think i was so intimidated intimidated by him as well yeah. like he's like this big hunky so, new zealand guy or okay. something so wait was the previous season not cuz it was all adult stars in your season was the previous season not adult no, stars no it was as well but it i was. think it's like only fan stars as well so right, okay. i i forget his name He's just right. like some hunky Australian guy. Right. And he fucking swooped in and won. Who was the worst cooker? Like, who seemed to be the most lost on your show? Who seemed to be the most lost? I got to say, like, and I love Jenna Fox with all of my fucking heart. But I, I saw some clips where she was just like, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I could see her getting like a little bit flustered with all of that. Yeah, maybe she did get a little bit, but I felt like she did pretty good on like her aioli. Cause I think like on that one, I didn't do my, my aioli. And I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it was just so intense and it was so, <laughs> I don't know. I, I also felt like I was flustered. Like, I think I blanched my fucking cabbage and he, the, the chef was like, no, 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 don't do that. And I was like, you, I don't know. Why do you have boiling water for no fucking reason? Like you're trying to throw us off. <laughs> so they would provide like all of the. Um... They would provide certain things. And like I said, they would have sometimes pots of boiling water. So you, I assume. You're like assume. I but... was like, oh, okay. I'm supposed to use oh, the boiling water. They were like faking you out. Yeah. Like sometimes he was faking us out. Sneaky. Yeah. Super sneaky. <laughs> um, so you won the grand prize of twenty thousand dollars. Do you know how you're going to spend it? I put it in a savings account for my daughter. So oh, like, all that's right. Smart. That's yeah. smart. I literally just started um, a like college fund account for my daughter. Like uh, just now, I just gave Masha the paper. Oh right hell now. yeah! Yeah. So. Oh, that's good. That's good. Because I don't There's know. There's all these like all extra benefits as well if you start paying her as like an employee with her chores and stuff. And, yes. Like, yeah. Yes. I talked to my accountant about that and he was like, probably need to wait until she's a little bit older because it's going to be oh. hard for you to say that she's working for you at three. Oh, okay. You know, um, I guess it depends. I don't on know. How you... I showed you pictures of my daughter window cleaning. You know what? I mean, my. <laughs> like... You know, <laughs> when Violet has no money for college, I'm just gonna tell her and be like, "It's because you wouldn't clean your room." Okay. <laughs> yeah. I could have paid you as an employee, but you wouldn't clean your room. So now you gotta go work at Taco Bell. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. It's your own fault. <laughs> so, um, I mean, obviously you have like such a storied career so let's go back to the beginning yeah how did you get into the adult industry at 19. oh yeah i'm sorry for everyone who's already heard the story because it's definitely like a broken record i don't think i honestly oh, don't think really? i've heard the story you haven't heard the story i don't think oh, so okay. okay that's good 
Um, so I actually started, well, I always say like first things first, like I grew up in South Florida. So mm -hmm. it's always like, to me, that's like a culture of like so much free sexuality. It's mm -hmm. like, it's hot. You're not wearing much clothes. It's hot at night. Like you're still not wearing much clothes. Mm -hmm. Like the, there's beaches, there's nude beaches, like the, the weather and the people are just so much freer with themselves. Yeah. So I feel like the culture is a little bit more, a little bit more sexually accepting yeah. in South Florida. And so I grew up with that around me. I grew up with this like free sexual being of myself. I was like having orgies in high school, things that I thought were normal, you wow. know, like I was just like super sexual or whatever. And so um, I was uh, going to school, like side note, like I just happened to be a sexual character. So mm -hmm. I feel like that's a part of like why I came into where I came. Mm -hmm. But um, I was going to college and my college was like pretty far from where I lived. I didn't want to do public transportation. So I was like, okay, I, I had totaled my car at the time. And so I was like, okay, I need to get more money so I can buy a new car. And at the time I had dated a guy who had taken me to strip, strip clubs. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they had um, like competition nights where the if you won you can get like five hundred dollars or whatever and so i did a competition and i lost because it goes based off of a plot and some other girl brought like her friends with her and so like i know i was like that's like a cheat like you shouldn't yeah. be allowed to do that you bring your entourage yeah it's like that's bullshit. like not fair some of us bitches really needed that fucking money and we were working hard and i threw my i like the, even when thinking about like what I wore to the strip club for my first dance was like just regular like Target bra and underwear and like <laughs> I was like oh my god also like that's probably why I lost I was just like this obviously broke girl mm -hmm. trying to get money um and so I lost, but the I still needed money in the club was like, well, if you want to work the rest of the night, you can. And I was like, oh, okay. So I worked the rest of the night and they offered that I could have a job there. So I, I kept working there. Um, but I like didn't know how to make money. I always call myself a dolphin, not a shark, because like I just didn't know how to get the guys mm -hmm. to pay me. And I'm such a social person that I would be like talking to them. And I felt like they would hustle me because they're like, oh, a stripper who works for free. Mm -hmm. You know, like she's just hanging out with us. Yeah. And so... And as well as, like, I didn't have, like, the best luck with some of the girls where, like, uh, with, when I was, like, hanging out with some of the guys, the girls would be like, that's my client. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, have him. Like, I'm not trying to have any troubles. Like You didn't know I, about I, the I, strip club politics. I didn't know. I was so, like, naive and dumb and, like. And like I said, and the guys would take advantage of me because I was just like social. Mm -hmm. And so I decided like, I, cause like the most money I made one night was like 80 bucks. That's... Like I was a horrible stripper. Yeah. I was so bad. And so I was like, I'm going to go back to like a regular minimum wage job <laughs> because like I'm not good at stripping. And so, um, one of the girls was like, oh, well, do you want to do uh, porn? Like you can, you can do like a, you could be an extra and you'll make like 250 bucks. And I was like, that sounds good. Like that's more than what I'm making now. Mm -hmm. I'm already like showing myself naked and mm -hmm. everything. And like at the time I was already like dancing in Miami, showing myself or mm -hmm. whatever in the clubs. I've been clubbing since I was like 15 and everything. So I was just like that kind of person. And so I was like, okay, like I'll be an extra and everything. Uh, but I will say on my first day uh, as an extra, they did try to get me to perform as the boy girl but, um, performer. And I was like, no, I'm on my period. And they're like, oh, you can do this thing with a fucking makeup sponge. Oh, and I was God. like, you're psycho. Like, <laughs> OK, get out of here. And were so, you just using that as an excuse, though? Or were you? Really no, like I mean, I did have my period. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if I would have felt pressured into it, mm -hmm. but I was like, I'm definitely not sticking a fucking makeup stuff makeup sponge in my yeah. vagina because yeah, yeah. this was before I knew about porn. Right, so I right. was like merely supposed to be an extra and then I was like, no way, I'm not just doing that. And so, because I'm imagining I'd have to go to the hospital to get the makeup sponge out. Yeah, you yeah. Know? which like, has happened to um, some people. Oh my God, really? Yeah. Oh God. I mean, sorry for bringing it all down. But yeah, I mean, there's been a couple of girls that like, you know, it just gets stuck up there or. Oh, oh God. And then, but that's pretty rare. I know of like, one person that happened okay. too. Damn. I won't. I won't say it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Don't say it. I'll but like, I, 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 uh, I didn't even know that happened. Um, but so they. I just stayed an extra. Um, and I loved being on set though because I did in the VIP. So it was like fifty girls, and they let us drink and everything. And there was then the main performers, but we would like be drinking and dancing. And I made friends with some of the girls and like. 
Uh, then I was watching, I remember my first scene was uh, with Jay. I wasn't performing, but I watched them. And now I know who they were. At the time, I had no idea who they were. Yeah. But it was Nikki Delano and Jay Mack. And I oh, watched wow. them. Yeah. And I, I I didn't know that Jay Mack was performing back then. I know Nikki Delano. Yeah. I, I don't know if they had like, because I think Nikki Delano hadn't been performing for that long. Yeah. And so I think that they were both fairly new, but I still had no idea. I only now know this after years. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Of course. You know looking back but um seeing them have sex was so hot to me because also jay mack is like this big manly man mm -hmm. i'm like hanging out with high school dudes or whatever yeah. and then um Nikki Delano is just like, you know, she's had her tits and she had her ass and she's like this blonde bombshell with the big lips. And it was just like, I was like, oh my God, like this is like porn. And it was so hot to me. And I was an extra maybe like five more times. And each time I would slowly do a little bit more where I was like, okay, now this time I'm going to like flash my tits and like make out with a girl. Okay. Now this time I'm going to like maybe play with the girl's like pussy or mm -hmm. whatever. And then like, finally I was like, okay, like I feel confident and comfortable enough to be a performer because like even though I did try they tried to finesse me or whatever but I was like okay whatever I can like look past it or whatever mm -hmm. because I know I know myself they couldn't they didn't force me they mm -hmm. asked I said no and that was it and everything and so I didn't feel like I I know that porn and, and it's, to me it's any place can put pressure on you to do yeah. things that you don't want to do totally. and it's not just limited to porn so it's limited to you being responsible for yourself and so I gave porn that uh, that opportunity and I learned through being on set that I liked how porn was run. It to me it felt professional on the sets that I was on because I feel like I also wasn't like put in positions to shoot for like super shady companies. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't like in these casting couches mm -hmm. in my first environment. So it was like it was pretty big productions because I was like on an, an extra with like 50 other girls and stuff right, like that. Right. And it was like in the VIP. So it felt pretty like legit and everything yeah. like that. And so I felt pretty confident wanting to put my foot into porn. And so then I reached out to Bang Bros and was like, I want to shoot like my own scene. Like, let's like, how do I do that? And everything like that. And so then it just kind of like made my way in and met uh, Type 9 Modeling was my first agency. Oh God, yes, Kevin. I remember them. Um, yes, I think actually before them, it was this other lady. Oh my God, it was this other lady. I totally forgot about her. Who was this lady? I don't even remember her name. She was this random lady and she introduced me to type nine modeling because type she didn't have uh, opportunities in California and type mm. nine was like, we could get you to L.A. Yeah. And I was like, because they were like, you can't survive in Miami because you're like a white girl. They're like only the Cuban girls can make a career here in Miami. Oh, like like the La Latina women mm -hmm. can like thrive in Miami. But yeah. they're like, you need to go to L.A. to if you want to do porn. And I was like, OK, that sounds fun. Like, mm -hmm. let's go. And. I went and started shooting and that was like, that was it. And that was it. And you felt yeah. like comfortable from the beginning? I, I did actually, I, I did feel comfortable from the beginning. There was definitely like sketchy moments mm -hmm. here and there. And I definitely had like my own share of like weird experiences or like my own share of like doing things that I didn't want to do. But in the end to me, it's like a job is a job. And like, sometimes you got to fucking do shit that you don't want to do. And like, I think about like my forefathers and like my great, 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 great grandmother. And it was like, she probably did a lot of shit that she didn't want to fucking do. Yeah. And so sometimes you got to bite the bullet and suck a yeah. fucking dick that you don't want to suck. And it gets the fucking job done. You know, like that's just the Can reality of life. You t-shirt. Sometimes you get to suck a dick that you don't want to suck it's just true but i know? guess the difference is too though is that it's online forever right like are there any scenes that are online that you're just like fuck no like, no i don't care yeah I, I i'm i'm way past that i'm way past the like scenes or the shitty photos or the whatever it's actually made me quite confident in myself mm. because i'm like I look that bad for just like a millisecond that's captured online forever. But like, I don't look that bad 24 seven. Yeah. It's just like one second yeah. that's captured forever yeah. or whatever. But like, I don't know, like I'm not really worried about like my content being online. I know it's there. I've come to terms with it. It's like, 
I've come to terms with death. If I die, I just you die. Yeah. It's just the reality of it. Like, okay. See, like that's something that I have a hard time coming to terms with. I can come to terms with a lot of other things. Death is a tough one for me. I think it's also for me is I feel like I've had quite adventurous life that I feel like if I die, then like what am I complaining about? True. Like, but like there's so much more. To there live is, but for. we will never have it all anyways. Like I, in my fantasy world i would have the knowledge of everything i would know yeah. how to build a microphone like yeah. i would know carpentry i would know everything but like i know that's impossible so yeah. it's like what can i do i'm only gonna know what i know but don't you also like <laughs> this this podcast is taking a dark turn <laughs> but um <laughs> okay. like do you ever worry about like i think about non-existence like how can you just not exist anymore like all this that sounds peaceful i guess oh. <laughs> see it's so interesting how people see it differently because i'm just like how all this stimulus all this everything but like think like, about life and then like, forever like there's nothing like, you look at how much anxiety it's causing you to think about i know not having existence and how much peace you'd have if you didn't have existence because then you just have anxiety for all eternity I like know. I don't want anxiety for all eternity and being like, when is this over? But what if there's a what if there's a hell and it's just being anxious I'm atheist. So. I am too. <laughs> I am too. Though I will say, like, there have been times that in the back of my head, I'm like, fuck, man, what if I'm wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's that, but I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't really believe that. But um, I I I just like to be present, and I don't yeah. ever want to like psych myself out because I'm like oh what about later mm -hmm. I better yeah. like check in with like whatever might be and I'm like yeah. but that's taking away from me being right here right now yeah like do you have any kind of like faith or higher power or belief in I just believe anything? in like frequency and like the universe like mm -hmm. definitely everything's like connected and everything like that and like I believe like we are connected and I don't think that people kind of even realize that like I feel like I believe in like like a telepath type thing where like you know like when you think of someone and then they fucking text you mm -hmm. and I'm like we're fucking connected like mm -hmm. there's like weird shit like that that I like believe in like frequency I guess yeah. is what it is yeah so. I definitely believe that what you put out there is what you get back right you put yeah. out like good vibes like people want to be with you they want to give you like opportunities you put out negative vibes and i don't people... know sometimes i feel like that's tricky though because like sometimes i pe i feel like i put out negative vibes because like i'm like so insecure and so like so many times i like just hate myself mm -hmm. and then i'm like but is that like really bad and then i'm like but i don't want to like fake love myself yeah <laughs> like i don't know like i don't know i'm like i feel like it is and like i feel like you don't want to always i feel like you almost want that negative self-hate because that will draw more love sometimes to an extent not that i'm saying you should hate yourself all the time but i guess it's like a humbling thing where it's like if i feel like you're always so yeah positive and you're always so like i don't know how to like phrase well no it. okay so it's funny because when i think about a lot of these like existential things i actually think about things that guests on my podcast have told me like honestly this show has like enriched my life in a lot of ways because I've talked to so many people. And um, when I think about like sadness and depression um, and I think about how feeling your feelings is really important and that's something that I always struggled with, which I, which is why I was an alcoholic, right? I was like, I didn't want to feel those uncomfortable feelings. So like, I'll just drink and then like they'll go away. But then of course they're there the next day. I think about Kiss of Sins and Kiss of Sins came on and she talked about how when she's sad, like she embraces it. She's like, I put on sad music. She's like, I feel it. Like I let myself cry. Yes. Like she's like, I like it was so interesting. She's like, I welcome it. Like I like it. And I remember at the time thinking like, how could you possibly enjoy being sad? Yeah. But then like she's able to process those feelings and then like move through it, you know, and then like, you, you know, because we're all ups and grief. downs. And I feel like the American culture is so bad at it because even yeah. if you just look at like if your spouse dies, you have like four fucking days to like grieve and then you have to go back to work or, and things like that. There's yeah. like, what is it like a 12 day max type cap out or something like that? Like there's some like fucked up shit and all these like really bad rules when I think it comes to like grieving and sadness. Mm -hmm. And like, I just feel like our culture does not teach us how to like be in the moment and it's like, get, get back to work, get back to it, you know? Yeah. And like, so I feel like there's definitely like a huge 
problem with people being able to like understand their sadness. Probably why we have a therapy problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like so many people are seeking therapy now because they're like realizing, oh, I've been suppressing so much of my feelings for so long. Yeah. Like, yeah, when my dad died, I definitely like allow, I feel very grateful that I had had enough therapy, that it had enough program that I was able to like really grieve. allow myself to grieve and to process it. And I was a mess. Oh, I, yeah. Actually, I cried so much. I gave myself an eye infection in both eyes that permanently damaged my tear ducts. And now like I have to get stints put in my eyes because my eyes don't moisturize themselves properly at night. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I know it's crazy right but like I let that happen like and then I feel and then it was weird because then I felt guilty afterwards almost because I had like moved through the grief earlier than I thought I would you know what I mean like I'd kind of processed it and moved and then I was like wait I shouldn't be okay yet like I should still be really really yeah. sad it was very confusing Interesting. yeah but it's definitely um a different experience but it's something that we all go through right yeah and so, we all go through it so differently as yeah. well like yeah, yeah. so um <laughs> back to porn <laughs> god so humanize her no, yeah I'm just kidding. <laughs> you'd be like man how did, okay, they, how did I we chose go on this the path? profession i chose no i mean you know i i, I just love happen these... to be slightly you know alo- nope. aware i'm not aloof <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean i love these kinds of conversations definitely i had xander corvus on and we talked about like god and the meaning of life for like an hour oh, like yeah. we like barely talked about porn and i, I loved it it's one of my favorite episodes um so I mean, you know what, actually, I feel like this ties into like what we were talking about, like a sense of self. So have you ever had, did you ever have a moment where it really hit you, like just how big of a star you've become? Like, how do you, do you recognize that? And then like, how do you handle that? Um, I definitely, I don't feel it because I feel a lot of privacy at times. Mm-hmm. Like I don't. I, I'm not like a big celebrity necessarily, like in any means, like I'm not like a, I don't have paparazzis or anything like that. So I always feel very grateful that I have like my privacy and mm-hmm. I don't have any like crazy invasions or like, mm-hmm. you know, weirdo stalker people. Um, but I feel like really grateful in a sense that like, I don't know, like. I don't really feel like I'm like super famous, but there was definitely moments that I was like, whoa, like, like uh, when workaholics mentioned my name, like, I don't know, it was like maybe like 2015. And I was like, they know who I am. Like, there's like certain things that I, I feel like I stay so humble for so long Mm -hmm. that I didn't even realize, like, I feel like almost like didn't even give myself full opportunities because I didn't realize that they were there Mm because I felt like I was like just in the porn world. And like even when I started porn, like the only reason I started was because like I was like, I'm going to be on page like nine million and like no one's going to want me. Like I was Mm -hmm. like, they're not going to want I have small tits. I'm tiny, not voluptuous, like a brown hair. I'm basic, basic bitch or whatever. (laughs) Like I never I never thought anyone would really like me. So that's also why I started it. And so at no point was my goal to ever become like successful. Mm -hmm. like I only like just enjoyed being on set and I just wanted to like I wanted like I I think I in porn it's not that I was wanting to be successful in porn but I wanted like a good repertoire so like when I worked for companies I wanted people to like like me I Mm -hmm. wanted to be friendly and Mm -hmm. pleasant and like nice to be around because like I enjoyed being on set but I didn't really think about like the after being on set life and like the like the growth that I'm getting like online or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see that happening as well as like social media wasn't as big and Instagram hated us. So we're like getting deleted fucking left and right. So like, it's hard to track that kind of notoriety as well. And like, we were also so anti Pornhub at that time Mm -hmm. as well, because we were like, they're stealing from us. Mm -hmm. And so like, you would you wouldn't be wanting to track yourself on there either so i feel like i didn't realize i I don't really know when i got famous and i don't know how and at what point and like whatever like sometimes i think it's like when i did like my logan paul stuff but then i was like but then i think like but but workaholics mentioned me before i was even on logan paul so like when did it happen i don't you got on logan paul 
because you were famous, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like I don't know when it happened or really how it happened, and but it, it somehow happened. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was just like, oh, I think I'm pretty popular, and and then I would get recognized in public a lot when I was younger, but confused with the modern family girl so like people would always think i don't know her fucking name but they would be like oh wow they're like i love your work and i'd be like oh thank you and then like and then later it's like modern family and i'm like oh no like now i seem like a crazy person because you think i'm (laughs) pretending to be someone but i actually have like a totally different type of online work (laughs) like i remember the last time i shot you was for twisties and we shot at that ballet studio with alina lopez oh yes yes and you came in and i think you were wearing like a bunny onesie or something like that. You were wearing like something Maybe very like onesie. something. Onesie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> monkey. It was really cute. And I remember you walked in and there were these construction guys outside, like literally like drilling when you walked in. I remember them like kind of looking at you. And then I went back outside later to ask them when they were going to stop making so much fucking noise <laughs> yeah. so we could shoot the scene. And they were like, is that Riley Reed in there? And I was like, no. I'm like, I know she looks just like Riley. People <laughs> confuse her all the time, but it's not Riley. <laughs> I wish it was Riley. I would love to shoot Riley. Because I honestly, like, I didn't want them to, like, hang yeah. around and, like, follow you afterwards. That's fair. You know what I mean? Well, that's crazy. They recognized me in a monkey onesie. I, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, you had no makeup on, nothing. You were in a monkey onesie. And they were just like, that's Riley Reed. <laughs> and I don't think they believed me when I told them that it wasn't. Yeah, probably not. I don't know. Like. But yeah, I don't know how it happened. It just happened one day. And I was like, I'm all over the place and people know who the fuck I am. And like, yeah. people jerk off to me. And I have like crazy long lines at AVN. Like that was super weird to me. Yeah, like, yeah, that that's definitely a good indicator for sure. How do you stay, I mean, if this feels like kind of a cheesy question, but how do you like stay humble? <laughs> I don't Like I, how do you like stay yourself? Like how do you stay grounded? I think, um, just uh i don't know i don't think i'm that much of a narcissist and i I think because i still like don't love certain things about myself Mm -hmm. that it keeps me like you know i keep myself insecure enough (laughs) (laughs) gotta keep those insecurities going (laughs) yeah i don't know like but i i don't know i just like i also like who i am and i i feel like I know that I'm different and I know that I've like obviously everyone is so different from who they were 10 years ago and like relationships change like everyone's relationships with their parents change from 10 years to the what they are now and everything so it's like you're always like evolving but I guess like my whole goal has always been like to grow better and deeper and to try to learn how to be just like a healthier person and like have a healthier mindset and to be more empathetic and have compassion and like I try to just have mindfulness I feel grateful because my father I think is pretty mindful Mm -hmm. uh, of things and he's taught me this kind of mindfulness and so I feel like that has opened the doors to me allowing more opportunity and and I the people that I have been inside my life I feel like I I feel very grateful for the people who I did stumble across because they impacted me in I feel like positive ways Mm -hmm. that kept me you know not wanting to you know grow a certain way but I I don't know I feel like I also just kind of stayed I'm a kind of an introvert I'm I'm not I don't have like that many porn friends Mm -hmm. I don't go out that much yeah stuff so same I don't know. I think that helps. Well, and you've expressed you've expressed like some vulnerability online and stuff like that. So yeah. I think that that keeps you relatable. Yeah, I think there's that. Yeah, I don't have like the best support group. My family's been like off and on throughout mm-hmm. my whole career, and like dating has been super tough, and friendships are hard. So yeah. I feel like there's always been a part of me that's been vulnerable that I'm like I can't be. I'm not awesome. Like, yeah, I yeah, can't yeah, even yeah. keep a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so I want to talk about all of that. Obviously, meeting your husband, maybe um, your changing relationship with your family, and of course, becoming a mom. But we're going to take a quick commercial break first, and then we'll be right back. Hey, guys. Happy 2024. Blue Chew is here to help you kick off the new year with confidence. It's got the same active ingredients that you find in Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form. And guess what? It's made right here in the USA. But what I love about Blue Chew is the convenience. No awkward doctor visits, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. 
It's prescribed online by licensed physicians and it's delivered right to your door in a discreet package. And with New Year's resolutions in full swing, why not add improving your confidence in the bedroom to the list? Blue Chew can help you with that. And for our listeners, we have a special deal to kick off 2024. Visit bluechew.com and get your first order for free when you use our promo code HOLLY. Just pay $5 in shipping. So get this new year started right with Blue Chew. That's bluechew.com. Use code HOLLY to get your first order for free. Just pay $5 in shipping. Hey everybody, we are back. So in 2020, you recorded a very raw video talking about how porn has affected your life and relationships, especially with your family. How has your relationship with your family changed since you first got into porn? Uh, My relationship with my family, as I feel like many people's family, it it changes a bit uh, once I started doing porn. Um, They were all at first like, you know, not loving it which i feel i i can completely understand yeah. like i can completely understand because my job choice it it does affect them yeah. you know it, it it affects them in their day-to-day life if they happen to have like photos of me on their desk or things like that and it, it definitely affected and there was like early on in my career i remember i had a cousin who didn't invite me to her wedding because i was porn star right yeah. and you know things like that definitely like made me sad but like I can't deny them that like there are certain things that I realize that there are I carry a lot of weight and they have to carry some of that weight as well and that's definitely something that I feel like I've realized more as I've gotten older and I think when I was younger I was looking for a lot more support Mm -hmm. and stuff like that which I still think I should have had and everything Mm -hmm. I I feel like you know my parents don't come from like the best upbringing I found out that like I just recently found out that my mom was like kidnapped from her mom like her dad kidnapped her and like took her she lived in like seven different states when before she was five because he was like running from a private investigator like in the 70s you know and it's like yeah and like so it's like Things like that that I hear about, like, now that I learn about, like, my parents, I was like, oh, that's why you weren't the best parents. Of It makes sense. Yeah, you know? it's interesting when you get older and especially when you become a parent. Yeah, you after realize... having my daughter, she yeah. changed me. So my yeah. fucking wiring in my brain was, like, yeah. re-circuits. And, yeah. like, I'm a whole different person after yeah. having her. I mean, it makes you realize that everybody's, like, just doing the best with the tools they were given. And some yes. people weren't given tools. Yeah. Like, at all. Oh, not a, my parents parents grew up in like Carroll City, Miami. And so like, if you know what that is, you know, 305, like, you know, Carroll City, it's like, it's not the best neighborhood. And there's not the best information there. You know, you don't have people who have the most information available and accessible. And so like, they didn't know much. And and my mom was raised by her grandparents. So it wasn't like her parents. So that's like even a a generation, you know, so like, they had their own issues of being, you know, grandparents and of a different generation and everything like that. So it's like, I feel like there was a lot of, you know, misparenting and whatnot that happened Mm -hmm. in their lives that led to my, you know, childhoods that's not the best or whatever. And that led to us having kind of like, you know, those broken dynamic and whatnot. But as I've gotten older and then after having my daughter is like what really changed it because I didn't have like a relationship with kind of either of my parents. I was a little bit more friendly with my dad, but not as much my mom. And I basically realized like if I had, if if my daughter hated me and was having a child and didn't tell me or include me or anything, I would be fucking distraught. I would be so sad if Emma like just denied me any relationship with her and her child. Mm And so I was like, okay, I can see where that would be really hurtful. So I'm not going to do that to you, mom, because I'm not going to be that malicious. And Mm -hmm. like, you're not that fucking terrible. And so don't fuck it up. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this relationship is over. (laughs) And so uh, we've maintained a pretty good relationship. And I've had to set some boundaries here and there within within it. But um, it's been a lot better. And it's been all focused on like family dynamic which has been really really great and so it's definitely made me want to like learn more about my family and my own traumas like like I don't remember a lot of my life like pre like I think before five and like I don't even it's like so spotty I have like like signature moments that define like certain ages but like I can't remember in between it and yeah 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 so it's it's pretty normal though 
No, I don't know. When I talk to certain people, I feel like, and especially my sister, like, remembers, like, everything. Like, mm. I remember stuff. Like, I don't remember stuff that my sister, like, remembers very vividly. And we're only, like, 14 months apart. Right. And so, like, I think that there's a lot of, and, like, my sister also struggles a lot more. So I mm-hmm. feel like almost maybe her having that memory bank maybe put more trauma in my brain being like swoop yeah was like you're gonna survive because we're just not even gonna remember any yeah. of this it's funny how your brain protects itself by like yeah. forgetting stuff yeah i think i think it did but it makes now having a daughter makes me kind of want to like learn that stuff about myself to just make sure i don't do anything that's Dude. like fucking subconscious that i was yeah. like oh Oh, because yeah. I like I realized like my mom was kidnapped. My mom kidnapped us. And I was like, I hope I don't fucking kidnap Emma one day. <laughs> like, I see this as like a reoccurring generational yeah. thing that has occurred in my life. Like, yeah, I don't want to. I don't know if my great grandmother was also kidnapped. Like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> it's it's crazy. And it's actually like I think about I think about that a lot now. The tools that we have to oh, raise yeah. our children now, like. I've taken, you know, the toddler like online workshops and I've read the books and I've listened to the podcast. The tools that you have <clears throat> is only like suggested to you based off of like who you're around and whatnot because like the the tools that I'm using and when I talk to other moms, they're like, I've never even heard of this. Mm. And they're like, what is this? And I, and I don't know if it's just like what they're researching is different. Like their keywords are bringing up other things that my keywords are bringing up. And so like, I feel like sometimes like it's, you, it is more accessible, but it's still not all there. Yeah. You know, like, like how come I know about this? Like I'm probably, I always enunciate it wrong. Montessori, Montessori. No, Montessori. Uh, people, I think say Montessori as well. No, they are wrong. Mon- Montessori. I went to, I went to Montessori preschool. They oh, you did? Mon- yes. Okay. Mon- Montessori. Montessori. Okay. Montessori. But like, she had never even heard of Montessori. And like, our daughters like are like the same age. She's in LA. Mm -hmm. She's also like an influencer. Like, there's so Mm -hmm. many things that I was like, how do you not know about this? Interesting. And so like, there's so much information that is accessible, but still people don't, aren't always given it. Yeah. You know, it's like, she didn't learn about it until I presented it to her. Right. You know, and so like, I feel like it's still still kind of hard to get that information to an extent. And there's also like, you know, different information. One of the things that I remember reading about was um, the timer situation, right? And there's like some people who swear by the timer, meaning like, okay, because the one thing that like toddlers hate is being like interrupted in the middle of doing something, right? They want, they don't like change, so you have to prepare them. So, you know, one person suggested, oh, set a timer, be like, okay, Violet, you know, in three minutes, you can play with your dolls for three minutes and then we're going to take a bath, right? And set a timer for three minutes and then when the timer goes off. And there was one person who said, no, that's terrible. You know, it, I don't know. I forget exactly the reason why. And I didn't do it for a while because I thought that this woman's advice was right. And then finally, like, I couldn't get that bitch to get in the fucking bath. And so I set a time. She fucking loves the timer. It's so weird. The timer goes off and she's like, okay, it's time. And she like turns it off and like she goes and does the thing that she wants to do. I'm like, how is this working? Yeah. Every kid is so child. Every child is so unique and everyone is so different. And like what, what works for one doesn't work for another and everything. And it's like, I remember I'm like, I love like Miss Rachel. And she was like, like, I'm going to make some toys, like post your things that you would love. And I was like, I would love this, 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 this. And so many other parents were like, well, my child would hate that and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, like post what you're like. Why do you have to like hate on me for saying what I think my like what my child would like? Like, yeah, I just know what my child would like. Like, that's yeah. just my child. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know. It's just like it, it's really annoying and frustrating when people just are like constantly pushing their own parent stuff God. on you because and of, parents are because the worst of their own that. trauma. I know yeah, they're the worst. Yeah. Like moms. Like I remember um, looking at Lena's like uh, profile, like Lena, the mom, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you guys are good friends. And I remember there was something that she put up about Parker and she was like giving her like feeding her what she was eating and she was just giving her like but in smaller pieces and there was just like people that were like you can't feed your child that and Lena was like yeah she, she likes this stuff like but I cut it into small like you know what I mean yeah. just like weird shit like that it's like dude yeah like she's 
like you're right. I mean, every child is different. Yeah, every child is different. Everyone's teeth, like my child, like her teeth, her first teeth that came in were like her, her like canines. It wasn't these ones. It wasn't these ones. It was this one. She was like, like a little vampire. Yeah, she looked like a little fucking vampire. I'm just like everyone is so different. Like yeah. you can't. Everyone's just different. It's yeah. not gonna work for all. Yeah, this is true. So, um, speaking of different, you are married now. Yes. How did you meet your husband? Tell me. Tell us a little bit about him. So my husband is Pasha on Instagram. He's Pasha the boss. Uh, he is a Red Bull athlete or parkour athlete. And he also does like stunt and movies and stuff. But he's been doing parkour since he was like, I don't know, 14 or something like that. Um, he's born Latvia. Um, and he came here like shortly before COVID. And that's kind of like when we met. He kind of got trapped here because of mm -hmm. COVID. He couldn't leave the country. And um uh, I saw him just on Instagram. I thought he was like this cute guy on Instagram. And at that point, I was just like wanting to like date boys and everything like that. I wasn't like seeing anyone seriously. And I hadn't been in a serious relationship in like actually quite a few years at that point. And I was like, OK, like I'm looking I had I went through like my fuck girl phase and everything like mm -hmm. that. And I was like, OK, like now I want to be like taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So like how can I like find someone to take me seriously? And so um, that was always really difficult. But I, I saw him on Instagram. I thought he was like super handsome mm -hmm. and I slid into his DMs. But like I waited for the opportunity because I was like, how can I slide into his DMs and not come across as fucking brightly read the porn yeah. star? Yeah. Like, how can I come across as like Ash? Yeah. And so he finally posted about a book that I had read, which is like the self-help book. What was it? Uh, the the Subtle Art of Giving a Fuck. The Subtle Art mm -hmm. of Not Giving a Fuck, I think it is. Uh, I don't Probably know. Probably Not Giving a yeah, Fuck. Yeah. The Subtle like Art of Not Giving a Fuck, I think, is what the book was. Um, and that's kind of was my way in because I was like, all right, like I'm going to like show you I read books. I'm like I'm somebody like I'm not just like this like sexual item that I like, portray myself on Instagram. Like I'm not just like I'm not just the photos on my wall feed. Yeah. You know, so like um, I wanted to hang out with him, but like by doing like a collab or whatever, because like I was like, I don't want to go on a date because like that implies romantic gestures. So like, let's just do a collab because that's kind of like doing a podcast. It's mm -hmm. like very kind of professional. It's not yeah. like romantic at all. Yeah. You know, and and, it's a good way to get to know somebody. Yeah, it's a good way see to see if there's something there. Yeah. To catch their vibes without it being romantic. So I was like, OK, you're an influencer. I'm an influencer. Like, let's do like a, a weird collab. I was like, what are the worlds of like Red Bull athlete with porn star? That's fucking yeah. crazy. Even though we drink so much Red Bull on set, <laughs> like they should sponsor me. Red Bull fucking sponsor me. Dude, I remember. <laughs> I remember literally when I was working for a company that I shall not name because I don't want to make them sound like assholes, but like their budget was so low that I had to like take Red Bulls out of the fucking cooler of drinks that I provided because like they wouldn't cover it and people were just super bummed about it. And then yeah. finally I was like, fuck, I'm just going to throw Red Bulls back in there. Yeah, because people need the fucking Red Bulls on yeah. set. They're long days. Yeah, they are long days. And those Red Bulls help. Yeah. And like coffee just can't do the same thing that yeah. those Red Bulls do. Yeah. Like, and also coffee breath and all that stuff. I yeah. Mean, you're being intimate with another person. Yeah, exactly. It's so, not It's not yeah. sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I slid in his DMs. We did a collab. And at the collab... During our collab, we like instantly had chemistry. We were just like shooting little love hearts at each fucking other. Like while we're filming, at one point he's like playing with my hair, like you could see it. And I was like, you didn't have to play with my hair. You just you just wanted to be playing with my hair. And so there was like just like this really cute intimacy that we had, and uh, we hung out a couple of times, and then we were basically inseparable ever since. And and you um doing what you do for a living was never like a problem for him it definitely like was like a little bit of a thing you know there's like the there's I, I feel like sometimes it's like a drug you know like when you first take it you get that fucking like excitement and mm -hmm. everything and so like you first get Riley Reed sliding into your DMs you got this whole ego boost mm -hmm. and you're like yo homies look at my fucking DM yeah. Riley just slid in like you know, and so I feel like there's like that bit that's like really like cool and everything and then there comes a moment of like where you start to take me more seriously or you you start to like humanize me and i'm starting to humanize myself and like i feel like that's always where it starts to get like a little troubling yeah. with with guys and one of my favorite things uh one of pasha's friends it's like a really good friend of his um who i also love this guy stas he told pasha because pasha's like i don't know what to do and um 
the guy was like, people are going to think you're stupid if you date her and people are going to think you're stupid if you don't date her. So he's like, what kind of stupid do you want to be? That's and good, I like that. I was like, stars. Yeah. Oh, you go, guy. Like, yeah. thank you. Like, thank you. And so, and his mom was actually really, like, supportive and everything like that. And so, like, I think that helped, like, when, because he has a really good relationship with his mom and his family. So, like, they were, like, really supportive and everything like that. And they didn't feel, like, closed minded by me and they were like yeah like if I if they're like if I if porn was here I'd probably do it too like they yeah. were just like so that must have meant a lot it was actually like his family being so supportive is like emotional for me it's yeah like, it makes me so happy and it's like so because that's the second hurdle right like if your boyfriend can get over it then what do you well, tell because I dated family? so many guys where their families hated me yeah. I dated one guy where like his sister came into town and anytime we would literally be like group texting, like, oh, let's go like hang out. Like, I'm going to come over. Like, let's go to dinner. And she'd be like, I'm going for a walk. Like right when I arrived wow. to go to dinner and I was like, she would just do everything in her power to like make it seem like she was cool, but then be like, psych. Yeah. And I was, it was like really, really fucking hurtful. And like, even like his father didn't even want to meet me and yeah. stuff like that like i've had so many families that were just like so kind of repulsed by me yeah and it was like it was not really great for me yeah. you know and and especially coming from like my family that's had difficulty with me and loving me for who i am and everything like that yeah. it's always like not super great to have like two families fucking being like fuck you and yeah <laughs> so, um his family being really supportive like really meant a lot to me and like even like his country is supportive like latvia like loves that i'm with pasha like i'm like fuck yeah latvia like shout they, out to latvia yeah they're like a supportive country like they're super great like i don't know it's they also love pasha and like everything that he's done like for them and like with mm -hmm. them and how he's just brought notoriety to the country and everything. But I just felt very grateful that even his country was like supportive and there was like yeah. articles about us getting married and stuff like that. And I don't know, it was, it was interesting, but um, yeah, we just like, we just vibe and it was definitely like a battle, but I think that he was like, he saw who I was and mm -hmm. like valued that more and everything. And I think that there's probably a, some, sort of like ego boost to be like I'm the man that's stronger than all these other fucking pussy ass bitches yeah. who can't be with a girl like her yeah. like I feel like there's something really empowering about yeah. that as well like I, I mean I, there I mean I know I'm gonna get so many people arguing with me about this but you know the way that guys have such a hang up about the men that you've slept with before that any woman has slept with before yeah. like speaks volumes about their own insecurity like oh, why does 100%. your body count matter if you're the one then you're the one like the people before if anything just yeah. gave you I don't experience think it's even to, just like, that I think that that's it's also just like the day-to-day -day interactions of like people being fans of me and then yeah. like you know that's like I drink after your wife. Yeah. You know, it's like, like, great, like, so do I. <laughs> like, we have second in common. Yeah, so I feel Except like... she's there with me when I do it. <laughs> yeah, no, so I just feel like that there's definitely, like, moments that can be challenging to one's, you know, self-worth and things like that. Like, yeah. I, I can see where it's a difficult position, and I, re I realize that it does require a certain type of person and everything. Like, I, I definitely sympathize for the guys who tried to date me. I'm mm -hmm. even just who I am plus being porn and yeah. like I'm not the easiest person to date and yeah. so um I feel like it can be it can be challenging but I don't know a lot of times I, I feel like I have way more sympathy for the porn guys because I just feel like the, the people don't care about them like onset or offset because like even the even viewers watching it are like shut up like I'm yeah. trying to be that guy yep. and you're breathing and like yeah. you know and it's like there's just so many things. It's like he's the man is so objectified from being on set to being off set to his dating life to just like so many things that I was just I'm like, I feel so grateful that I have a vagina and I do porn because yeah. if I had a penis and I did porn. It would be a totally different ballpark. Even like just having a penis and not even being in porn, but shooting it is a problem. You know, like I have like friends who are just cameramen and, you know, work on set and have problems dating women because they're like, oh, oh yeah. you know, like you're around all of these porn stars. You're probably like having sex with them when they're flirting with you. Oh, you know, I like I see. About that. 
because I've never had that issue. I've literally like never had a guy who'd been like, I don't like you working on porn sets. It makes me uncomfortable. They're always like, oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, like, can I meet Riley Reed? You know, yeah, like that kind yeah. of thing. Can I go on set? Yeah, yeah exactly. Which is always a no. Yeah. Um, but it's probably always asked. <laughs> yes, it, it very often is. Actually, the one person, well, the one person who really didn't ever want to come to set was my husband. Oh, really? Yeah, and I like made him come to set when I was shooting DP Star once, and he was like not – he was like very uncomfortable. <laughs> I just like, made him stop by. Also, Kieran was making fun of him, but, yeah. um, which oh, okay. was not helping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Kieran can be a challenge sometimes. Yes. If you're not that kind of social butterfly boy. Yeah, he's yeah. a little bit His on energy, the shyer side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Kieran's got a special energy. <laughs> yes, he does. A shout out to fucking Kirsten, who is an angel yeah. for marrying that man <laughs> and putting up with him her whole life. Like, that woman is – yeah. Damn girl. Damn girl. She's a first lady for sure. What is your favorite thing about your husband? Hmm. What is my favorite thing about him? Maybe his smile. He has a beautiful smile. I feel like his smile just like lights up the room. Like, I don't know. He's got a, like an infectious smile. Like, I think that's. If you're talking about physically, if you're talking about like personality. So things. We got physically. What about personality? I feel like we just like we get along like we we just get along on like the same page like really well. I feel like our humor and things like that are just like I don't, I don't know we we just like are on the same vibe. I feel like when it comes to like that and I'm 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 pretty picky when it comes to my humor and I think I think I'm a pretty funny person. Most people wouldn't see it because you don't hang out with me, but all my friends know I'm pretty funny. And so like I I feel like Pasha's pretty funny too and like we we get each other really well and even just like spending more time together he's gotten more of my humor and he kind of like mocks it a little bit and mm -hmm. mimics it um because i feel like i've helped his english develop as well like mm -hmm. like some of the first times when we met he would be like do you ready instead of like are you ready mm -hmm. and it was just like things like that i'm like oh, what, what was it he would be like uh he thought it was a it's a blessing in the skies Instead of it's a blessing in disguise. And I was like, so but sometimes moments like that, I was like, oh, you don't ever change. Yeah. Don't ever change. I'm like, it's don't so ever, good. Don't ever correct him on that. Oh, yeah. There's certain things that now I say blessing in, dis in disguise because I'm like, it's a blessing in disguise. I mean, you know what? That like also It makes works. sense. It, it totally does. Works. I was like, I was like, you got a fair point there. <laughs> so uh, you became a mom last year. How has that changed your life? that's changed like so much of like who I am and it's definitely like had a big career shift on me and it's made me want to like diversify myself in like a more entrepreneur more like business sense and stuff I want to be able to like showcase to my daughter that I am a woman of many hats and like I feel like I've always had this capability but I'm just like the money's in the porn mm -hmm. and everything like that and so like I've never like put myself really out there and so I feel like now I've been wanting to like you know kind of dabble in that a little bit more but also when I like started Ash Agency it was actually pre my daughter and I, I actually only started Ash Agency just to help my friends because I was like so fed up with all these like fucking shady ass stories of people getting like taken advantage of and I was like you know what like I need to like be able to like help these girls because otherwise like because the, sh the the shitty thing was is like you go with an agency and it's like they're gonna make you so let's say you're making like a thousand dollars a month we're talking about only fans yeah we're talking about only that fans. for people who may not know what it is okay we're talking about only fans and so like this girl she makes a thousand dollars every month on her only fans she can join with an agency who takes like 80 percent of her money but now she's making like she was now her profile is making like ten thousand dollars, but she's only keeping two thousand. Mm -hmm. It's more than her one thousand. So it's like she's going to go with the agency, even though they're right. taking a shit ton of her fucking money because she's still making more than she was when she wasn't with them. Right. So it was like that was what was really fucking pissing me off about the agencies because they were taking they were milking these girls for so much money, even though that and, and that was also um, I'm like a business lady. So like I had my own kind of 
team that I worked with who helped me run, run like I had my like employees they weren't a team they were like mm-hmm. my fucking employees mm-hmm. who I hired to help me like run my shit and so I knew what the breakdown costs were and so it would it basically to like have someone like running your stuff it it's operational costs are about like seven percent mm-hmm. of what your only fans income would be mm-hmm. depending on what your income but what my income was at that time it was about seven percent was of what it was a fair amount of like paying them and everything was mm-hmm. operation costs. So when I see these agencies taking like 30 plus percent, I was like, is... operation costs are only seven fucking percent. So like, you know, and for me, 30% I was percent is common. Yeah, that was like the common thing. Yeah. And so it was like really infuriating to me because I was like, they shouldn't even like I feel like 10 percent was like that's like I wish it was like the highest it would go, you mm-hmm. know, because I know like you're still making like a 3% profit off of your 7% operation costs. Mm-hmm. And so like that shit would just fucking piss me off. But I realize the company still wants to be able to make investments and they still want to have tools to grow and like developmental stuff. So you want a little bit more of a profit. So like for us, like my agency, we do like 15% is like 15 to 20. And I even fucking hate when it's 20%. Mm-hmm. And like you can hear it in my voice. It makes me mad. But sometimes we have to because those girls like will just be coming out of pocket. And like, but sometimes I'm like, let's go out of pocket. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. but like it's not how you run a business. But like, I just care so much about the industry and I care so much about these people getting what they're worth and like because I realize firsthand everything that you have to face being the person Mm -hmm. like the dating the bank accounts shutting you down people not doing business with you fucking what was it was like MailChimp won't fucking work with you like random fucking bullshit that you have to deal with that's not fair that it's like why is the guy who has his wife and family and is fine like why is he profiting so much you know when Mm -hmm. the girl is the one or the performer is the one who's struggling with just even her emotional life right. not even like her financial life but her emotional life you yeah know? so it's like they should be the ones profiting especially financially for all of the trauma and things that they have to endure because you don't realize the fucking shit that you do that you have to do and that you have to go through until you're in it yeah. you know some people watch these podcasts and are well informed but other people are not and they like they get into a bind and they need to do porn to get some fast money or whatever. And then there's all this fucking shit that happens within it, you yeah. know, or you think that you could do only fans, you can make so much money. And then like, it's not that easy. No, you, know? you have to have like a following because only fans itself is zero discoverability, yes, like within the platform. Yeah. It's so bad for yeah. growth. Yeah. Within this platform is horrible. So coming from somebody who is a veteran, who is obviously very successful, what is like maybe one piece of advice that you would get give to new girls coming into the industry? A lot of times I feel like I tell new girls to go on set because a lot of girls that are like the only fan girls have no experience how to run a set and like they don't even think about basic shit like water mm-hmm. like i've gone on so many of like these only fans trades and the girls don't even have fucking water yeah. and i'm like bitch you crazy <laughs> like you gotta have water yeah. you gotta have baby wipes you gotta have like and if you don't then washcloth or paper towels so i can like scrub myself and like there's just so many things that i feel like i learned etiquette and self-hygiene and i've learned etiquette with like people and like how to discuss like yes and no's and like things like that and like wardrobe or even like scene etiquette of like how's the light like how are we gonna like what was like blocking we're doing Mm -hmm. fucking blocking before sets and everything those who don't know blocking it's like you're like planning where you're gonna go for the shoot and what positions you're gonna do and like I feel like there's just so many people who just do OnlyFans and don't have any knowledge on how to actually run a production and yeah. run a set and make a mood board and create a call sheet and like they fucking send the call sheet like the night before yeah. with like the wardrobe and I'm like you expect me to have this tomorrow that you sent me at like nine o'clock you know it's like it's shit like that that's like it's <clears throat> too much that yeah. they, they just have zero experience like at least in porn and like you have somewhat of an idea of like what you're getting into and everything like that like you know your basics of like your wardrobe box and you know like the things like that but like with the only fans girls i feel like they don't have that same you know checklist yeah no definitely yeah i whenever 
whenever people like want to hire me to do a shoot, which I don't do anymore. Um, cause you learned. <laughs> yeah. I'm just always like, I have to produce it. Cause like, if I don't come with the waters and the baby wipes and the douches and, yeah, and when you rely on everything. someone else, you realize that they can't yeah. fucking do it. And then you're like, is it, you're like, am I not smart? You're like, am I really that smart? Like, how hard is it to think of water? Yeah, I guess it's just like, you know, lacking the experience. Yes, that's exactly. And so a lot of times I think the OnlyFans girls should go into porn mm -hmm. because I feel like if you really want to do it, then like you'll learn how to set up lights. You'll learn you'll learn how to pose like you taught me something like crocodile hands. Like <laughs> I learned crocodile hands from you. It taught me. I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I should be more dainty with my hands. Yeah, you know? hands are because I came in and I didn't know how to pose. Like I remember my first porn shoot. I have a photo like this. What was I doing? What was I doing? What is this? I'll have to show you the photo is horrible. If you were taking my photos, you would have never even allowed that photo. You would have been like, Riley, move your fucking arm. I would have deleted it out of the camera immediately. Yes, <laughs> but it's online. It, Bang Bros posted it with my set of my very first scene. This, and it's like so many things like that where I was like, these girls, they want to make money. They want to be hot. They they feel cute. They feel sexy, but they don't know how to be sexy. Yeah. And so it's like being on set helps you. Like, like Greg Lansky taught me how to dress myself to an extent because he was like, he did the like uh, the reality kings and stuff. And he like, he dressed the girls fairly good. And then he started Vixen and he like made the girls look really cute and stuff. So it was like, he taught me certain things about myself on how to like style myself to be a pleasing to, you know, a certain type of demographic of porn connoisseurs. And mm -hmm. so it's like, there's so many things that I learned being on set that I would have never known otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I know there's, it's it's a lot. I mean, it's I so always- It's informative. Experience is the best place to learn. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so speaking of all these entrepreneurial things that you've done, um, you recently founded Clona AI, which connects fans with ethical AI chat bots of their favorite porn stars. Um, where did your idea for this come up from and like, how's it going? It's going good. It's not my idea, so I cannot take credit. I'm just one of the co-founders. I kind of helped kind of gauge certain like limitations within it and um, what I want to do with it. But um, I have a really great tech team that I work with and they've been like very, they're, they're just like a tech team. So, you know, they know what's going on in the world. And, uh, and technology is changing fast. Yeah, it's, crazy. it's changing so fast and everything. And so, um, They've been building Clona for quite a few months, if not longer. Uh, we've been working on this for quite some time. And um, it's been really interesting to like join into it because it's like I was at first pretty nervous, actually, because I was like, what is this like AI clone? La la la. And like and you hear like you, I don't know. I feel like so many people have like fears about the AI yeah. and like but then I start to think about things like. Uh, credit cards like how scary were credit cards at one point you were like you always had cash you were like I'm not having my money in this fucking thing well think about television I mean when television first came along in like what the 1950s I mean people were convinced it was the end of the world or maybe it was but I mean you know what I mean like every time some big new technological advancement comes yeah. along it's always like it's always worst very case frightening yeah. but we adapt so fucking quickly yeah. and like I feel like that's what people really forget is that we adapt really fast and so I feel like that kind of helped me like have more ease as well as like I realized like there's so many things even just within myself like selfishly I'm like okay I'm 32 years old I'm not really shooting content anymore I'm trying to like kind of get out of it I have a daughter I might be getting pregnant again soon who fucking knows like so I need to start figuring out like what I'm gonna do with my life and this kind of gives like Riley Reed this longevity of like you know there's you know, five years from now, there's another guy who turned fucking 18 who's going to discover me. And then he's going to be like, oh, she's fucking 38 now. And I'm not interested in her. Mm -hmm. But, oh, I could talk to like her 18 year old version of herself. That is like this AI. Who it's like it's forever Riley. And I feel like that it gives opportunities to cr creators like myself to have this extra longevity of a career. Potentially, we don't know like what it's going to do and how it's going to go. But I feel like that there's like this extra security layer of what we've done for ourselves and like how 
much content we put out in the world and everything. It's like, here's another way for me to like be able to monetize myself and the things that I've done with myself and to almost immortalize myself yeah. in, in a way as well, which I feel like is this really cool opportunity for a creator, especially in my generation, because I come like, I come at the end of like mainstream porn to then OnlyFans to now potentially AI. And so I feel like this like really, I feel like I'm almost getting like three generations of experience yeah. in such a short, and just like five years time span. It's really been very interesting and very unique. And so like, that's been a really cool opportunity that I was like, I don't want to like miss this opportunity within myself to see how I can stay up with porn because also porn has been so great to me in my career that I don't want to feel, I don't want to feel like I've left porn behind and I don't want to feel left behind within porn. Like I want to constantly be able to grow with it and for me to also be helping it grow. So like, if it's growing into the AI space, like I want to make sure that porn is brought along with it. I don't want us to get like, you know, our likeness is just fucking used and abused. And it's like, you know, now these like new, just fake people, you know, like people are still going to want this human connection. So people are going to be maybe a little interested in like fake Amanda, but they're going to probably be more interested in like real Riley that can kind of connect. And they can almost even sometimes fact check it and be like, are you the mm -hmm. AI Riley? Like, yeah. I know what you said. You're favorite color wise like is yeah. it really this you because know? i mean this is so this is ai that you've trained yourself right so yeah. how did you train it uh so it was my my focus of training was a little bit different so like my team did all, some of like the personality training and like voice training and stuff like that on uh past uh, podcasts and like sex videos and stuff like that my focal point was like trying to train her into like the guidelines and because like I'm I think I'm still kind of more focused in like guidelines mm -hmm. as not as much personality as I should be a little bit more on the personality but I'm like I really want to make sure that like my AI doesn't say things that are going to be like triggering to people or that she can know how to like edit a conversation or change a conversation where it's like you know like like for example like I'm pro trans you mm -hmm. know not every person in the world is pro trans sadly I fucking wish they were but they're not mm -hmm. and so like maybe this like anti trans person is like talking to my AI chat bot and they say something not friendly mm -hmm. so I'm like I'm like how can I have my AI be like I politely disagree and I'm very supportive of them, but like, let's change the subject into something that we can both like agree upon, you right. know, like how can I like teach my AI to have these like politically conver correct conversations that's also still kind of defending my beliefs because I don't want my AI to be ever to be like, but yeah, fuck yeah, you're right. I don't like trans people. Like yeah. that's not appropriate. That's not true to me myself. And like, obviously my AI is going to say things that it, I may not actually love. Like I don't like coffee, but maybe my AI is going to be like, I love a cup of coffee. That's a harmless lie. Yeah. You know, like it's fine. But like, I don't want her lying about things that I think are genuinely true as well as, you know, because her whole thing is to be a companion to cater to mm -hmm. the user. So it's, to me has been an interesting battle of trying to figure out how to, you know, keep her true to myself and, and my moral beliefs while also still catering to the user because yeah. she is supposed to be this fantasy like character, Yeah. but she does emulate me. So I'm like, right. I need to find this like fine line. I think that's everyone's fear too, is that like AI is just going to say things that they would never say, go down yeah, it, paths they would never go. Yeah, it, it will. That's what, training. It is a really tricky thing because I I have to be really careful if like I'm editing her response that I don't edit it wrong because then she's gonna fucking remember that oh my god damn it that's a part of her personality now like yeah. if I ever say something wrong yeah so it's like I'm always I was like on hyper alert when I'm like editing her stuff to make sure that I'm like spelling things thing and I'm saying things correctly and I'm not like you know making her too chill or yeah. whatever. Yeah, um, it's so interesting though, and it's like you know the technology just continues to improve as time goes by. So oh yeah, I'm excited to see like where we're at in like a year. Like our goal yeah. is to be like you're, like webcaming. It's like kind of like old school, new school. It's like mm -hmm. you're webcaming with AI Riley. Mm -hmm. So so do they actually see your face? Not yet. We're hoping to have photo generation by February is our yeah. goal. And like that's also like an interesting thing because now I was like talking because they're like oh we're gonna have photos in February. I was like okay, but like what if some 
someone asks to see like Riley Reed with like another woman. So like, okay, am I, are you, are you going to like choose like a different creator on our platform's arm or, or like woman, or are you going to like just have like two Riley's and make, my hair different colors but then what if they want to see me like with a black girl you can't fucking do like blackface on me so well, like like i was like you better fucking think about this before yeah. you just start doing photo generation yeah. i was like there's a lot of like so my head is so wrapped around guidelines yeah. and like what we're going to allow to do and how we're going to em- make things happen and how we're going to structureize it because like i want to make sure that we're doing things correctly and i want to make sure that we're doing things right and like i i do want her personality to be great but i'm like I care more about like making sure that we're not like harming anyone. I was like, like I, my guys didn't know about uh sounding. I was like, have you guys heard of sounding? No, you haven't. Well, you better go in there and not let our AI do sounding. Do you not know what sounding? No. Is? Can you tell from the look on my face? Sounding is when guys put stuff like in their urethra, like in their pee hole, like when you put a pencil. Have you never heard of this? You've never heard of sounding? Guys who will do like this kind of masochistic, you put something in your. You, I have heard, heard of it. I put your pinky in there. Uh, yeah, there's a I couple. have had someone. Yeah, so some yeah. guys are into. But I had not heard the term. Okay, so that term is sounding. So mm-hmm. it's like, it's a sexual thing that some people like, but I was like, well, I don't want my AI to be telling. Or if someone asks, oh, can you tell me to do sounding? I'm gonna be like, sorry, no. Yeah. No, my AI will, I, I will not encourage you to do these types of sexual acts, you know. Yeah, because they're dangerous. This, it's dangerous, exactly. Yeah. It's very dangerous. So there's certain things that I was like, that my tech team doesn't know because they're a fucking tech team. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's yeah. like, there's certain things that I was like, wait, 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 before you do this, yeah. we need to do this. <laughs> it's crazy. There's so much to think of because, yeah, you're right. There's the tech and then there's the moral boundaries and then there's the trying to develop a personality that is like you. Yeah. You and know? that's a companion to every – Joe Schmo and Betsy yeah. Johnson in the world. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, oh, it's a new world that we are living in, my friends. It is very interesting. Well, Riley, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, it's been a pleasure me. to see you again. Yes, I know. It's been very long. It's been a long time. You know, I still have very fond memories of the gangbang that I shot for you. Oh! <laughs> One of the few that I ever did. I've, I've actually only done three shot three gangbangs in my life oh. and it was for you for lisa ann and for joanna angel oh, wow. and every time the creator hired me to do it and that's why like i enjoyed it because you guys were obviously into it you chose the talent oh, yeah. you had all the control there's so, so like, much empower that's always yeah. like, one of my favorite things to tell people is like writing the checks for the men after your gangbang is like yeah. but like you feel so g and gangster yeah like, yeah Go home now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can go home. Like, it feels so good. Yeah. I was like, that's such a feminist move. Yeah, like, yeah. Hi- hiring and doing your own, producing your own gangbang is, like, such an empowering move. Yeah, because it's, like, so often people, you know, see it as this kind of victimization of this unwilling participant, and she's being forced to do it, and all these guys are, like, you know, preying upon her and poor, like, innocent victim. And I'm like, that hasn't been my experience. No, it's definitely not. Like, definitely... I I've had so many women come up to me and tell me that gangbangs are their favorite videos of yeah. me. Like, and yeah. I don't have that many of them, but they're like, I love the gangbangs. It's interesting because it's like you can look at it the way that I just described, which is what I think a lot of like people who are anti-porn tend to look at it. And then you can look at it as like, I have all these men and they're paying attention to just me. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? They are just, just worshiping. Worshiping wow. me. It's like, I'm like Cleopatra, baby. I know. Like, yeah. And it's just funny because some people see it as like, oh, they're victimizing her. And then it's like, well, actually... It, I was you like, could, I'm victimizing all these men. You could flip <laughs> it and, like, she's enjoying it. Yeah, she's you know enjoying I mean? it. And she wrote the check at the end of the fucking day. Yeah. And she was like, bye-bye. Yeah. I get to sleep with my dog cuddled up at night. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyways, you should go. I'm sure you have it on your site or your OnlyFans. It was a Christmas one, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was the Christmas one. That's right. Oh, my yes. God. I just remembered. Yes. Yeah, with the presents. I had the little red robe. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. And then uh, the Steve. Tree. Didn't Steve... you do the one with Kimmy Granger's? Well? Afterwards, yes. Yeah, that yes. was, was so cute. I yeah. love those pictures yeah. with her. Yeah, yeah, it was really great. And then – um. Yeah, I just remember in the gangbang, Steve Holmes tied a little, like, bow around the base of his penis. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way that's going to stay on. And it fucking stayed on the entire scene. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. What a talented man. <laughs> he is a talented man. Is he still shooting? I think so. Is he? Wow. I think so. I don't know. Damn. Like I said, I haven't been on the set in, like, a year, so I don't know. Yeah, it's been a long time for me, too. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, in case people don't know, maybe it's simply because I know you've had your accounts deleted so many times. <laughs> can you let people know where they can find you online? Yes. Find me on Instagram, let Riley live and on Twitter, Riley Reed X3. And yeah, find me. Just Google me. Yeah. Just, you'll find, <laughs> just Google me. Just Google her. You'll find a lot. And then you guys can, of course, find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want to support this podcast and get access to the bonus Q&A that we're going to do um, and other ones with other favorite guests, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Happy New Year, everybody. Let's uh, hope that 2024 is going to be the best one yet. Have a good one, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>